أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah and Allah alone. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his last divinely sent messenger and the seal of the prophethood. Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends of Salaam Media, friends of Al Haj Maurice Ala Khan and the Afia Foundation. We want to welcome everyone, all of our friends and viewing guests or listening guests in South Africa, the United States, and around the world to this week's edition of A Conversation with Al Haj Maurice Ala Khan. I am pleased to be your host coming to you once again through the Salaam Media platform out of Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, for those unfamiliar with this network, Salaam Media is an online portal for humanitarian journalism. We don't just report the news, we advise you on what you can do about it. I've decided uh, brothers and sisters, friends of Salaam Media and your brother Salah Khan, that uh, I would dis dispense with a formal introduction of today's guests. And uh, the reason being is basically twofold. <laughs> For one, I, I believe the majority of those who will be viewing this broadcast know who he is. And, and secondly, because inshallah ta'ala, we're going to delve into uh, some of this brother's uh, personal history during the course of this conversation. And without any further ado, I want to welcome my dear brother, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. To the Salam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been a long time. Alhamdulillah, brother. I'm so, <laughs> so happy to have you with us. Likewise. Um, <laughs> tell me something. Before we get into the, the this conversation, do you remember when we first met? Uh, I can't remember exactly, but I... I'm assuming it was in association with Master Al Islam and Imam Musa somewhere, but I, I can be wrong. You know something, and, and, and you know something, it probably was. I, I have been racking my brain trying to remember <laughs> exactly when it was and what that circumstance was uh, 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 by which we first met. And it may very well have been uh, through Imam Musa. Um, what I do know is that it was around the time, shortly after we met, I had a visit to Mississippi where I you remember. lived and you were based at the time. Yes, I remember. I had family there and uh, my a family in, in Moss Point. And um, uh, you were, if I remember correctly, you were leading a community and living in Gulfport. Yes. Was it Gulfport? Yeah. And uh, you, you were uh, kind enough to host a, a visit. <laughs> Uh, my visit with the community. Uh, alhamdulillah, I, 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 it's one of my dearest memories. This was back in the 90s. Yes. I, don't, I don't remember what part of the 90s it was, but I know <laughs> it was the 90s. Right, <laughs> it was either right. early or mid 90s. But uh, I, I do warmly remember that visit. Um, now let's get into the meat and potatoes of our discussion today, my brother. Let's begin with where you were born, where you grew up, and what your formative years were like. I was born in uh, Mississippi, in a town called Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, actually, uh, I wasn't born traditionally in a hospital. I was born by a midwife. Okay. I, actually, that ended up being not too far from the first masjid 
that was uh, that was uh, constructed in Gulfport that by the grace and mercy of Allah, my, I myself and, and brothers and sisters uh, 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 created, for the lack of a better word. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in Mississippi. Uh, I grew up um, you know, relatively poor. My mother, uh, I grew up without a father. Uh, I didn't know until later on that he happened to have been a white man. And this is when my first year in the NBA. Um, my mother had the equivalent of an eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. And so even though we were pushed to be educated or, or to rather get a degree or, or no, a diploma, uh, she couldn't, I'm not saying what she couldn't see, but there was not talk about college. And it's probably because she couldn't see that far because she mm -hmm. never, never, uh, you know, got past the eighth grade. But we didn't grow up in a family where there was a lot of books. Uh, where there was critical thinking skills being developed, where there was problem solving being talked about and developed. So uh, this is kind of the environment I grew up in. Um, and early on, you develop in that environment, in my case anyway, you, you don't see yourself as uh, using academics as being successful. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I gravitated to sports. I, I knew that I had the abilities very early uh fast twitch muscles speed agility and so i capitalized on that to the best of my abilities using that as a tool to uh, get out of the ghetto um and i and i, and I developed early uh i, I would like to say I, I looked at myself as being inadequate uh inferiority complex when it came to academics mm -hmm. and so this is briefly Kind of like what I what I grew up around, and a typical story when you hear about children growing up in the ghetto, surrounded by the drug addiction, the prostitution, and all of those types of things. Now, did you? It, it, it's interesting that you know this this uh, reference you made to your biological father. Did you ever meet him, and did you all ever form any kind of relationship? I don't. She never gave me a name. Uh, mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that. And a lot of people don't know this, so I'm giving this to you. Um, my older brothers, my older and younger brother know who their father is. My older brother's father was a white guy who happened to be in the pharmaceutical business. Mm -hmm. And my younger brother's father is an African-American who was in the military. Mm -hmm. But all of the years of asking my mother who my father was, she always resisted. Mm -hmm. And she never gave it to me. And the only thing that she gave me was when my, my first year in uh, the NBA, I had to come at her from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would always say, boy, get out of my face. I don't want to talk about that. This particular time I said, mom, you know, I love you. I said, you've always been for me, my mother and my father. I said, but there's a part of me that's missing. I just, I just, I just want to know. And I said, it's not that if I find out I'm going to run and, and, and forget you, that ain't going to happen. It's mm -hmm. just a piece that I would like to know for numerous reasons. Right. And that's when she ended up blurting out. She said, he's white. And it took a year just to even get that out. And so I, I tried to make a joke about it. I said, darn, I thought I had more rhythm than that, <laughs> you know, just to kind of ease her conscience because I knew it was hard for her. Yeah. And uh, but what's interesting is that years later, as I began to think about it and ask some of my family and even her best friend who's still living to this day, you know, people in the South, sometimes they have a way of, I guess, in their way, honoring the dead. You know, my mother passed away some years ago, about 16 years ago, and I went back and I'm and I know Gail knows, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And she said, she just point out blank blanketly told me she said, Mahmoud, I promised your mama, mm -hmm. right? And so what, and I'm saying that because I, I started getting information from people. I did a DNA test with one guy. He wasn't white, but I said, okay, I'm gonna try and it came out negative. But then I started hearing about another guy, and I'm mm -hmm. not gonna mention his name, but he uh, he's, he's wealthy and uh, he's white in the South. And this particular guy, I was told that when I was playing basketball, not until I got to high school, cause he was not affiliated with sports in any way, shape or form. They had a, a club called the Admirals Hardwood Club. 
where they would, you know, people with money, they would put money into it so we can travel to different states and play basketball, stay in the hotels. Mm -hmm. Well, when I entered high school, because I'd have a name prior to getting to high school, he joined the club and started putting money in it from what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And I would see this guy on occasion drive through the, the ghetto and he would just drive slow and he would look at me like out of curiosity mm -hmm. and he'd keep driving. And I noticed this when I was younger, mm -hmm. but when he came on the scene, I'm like, man, this is the same dude. Yeah. So it, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a connection then, you know, I wouldn't be surprised because of who he is. You know, there's like, if you sleep with a black woman, you know, you never know, hey, keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Something can happen to you type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, it's not far-fetched to believe that that could be the case because I'm the only child that doesn't know. Okay. Yeah. What do you recall, um, wait a minute, before I get to this question, when, when, when did you enter the NBA and what was expected of you and what did you expect of yourself? Uh, I left after my sophomore year, so I think that was... 90, 1990, 1990, 91, I believe. Um, the expectations was that I was going to come in and be an impact. Uh, Doug Moe drafted for me, uh, traded, I think, Fat Lieber and Alex English. Uh, I think he had made a comment in terms of the scoring ability, uh, uh, not since Jordan or something like that is what he, I think, something alluded to. So he had plans for me to come in right away and be an impact. But... They, meet, they fired him. They brought in Paul Westhead, and we didn't click. And there was a lot of other things that took place, you know, uh, uh, my fault and this also. Was the, this was the Denver Nuggets? Denver Nuggets, yes, okay. sir, yeah. yeah. Denver Nuggets. So initially that was the the expectations. The expectations I had for myself, I mean, I, I dream big. I think big. It's mm -hmm. coming in right, mm -hmm. continuing what I, what I left doing at LSU. Uh, but the opposite happened, and it took me a, a couple of few, well, yeah, a few years uh, to get into my own uh, after going through some, you know, a lot of anxiety and stress and depression, you know, not being used to the weather, uh, coaching changes, we're not clicking. I really began to question. I was so close of, uh, like, literally letting it go. I was that, I was that, hmm. I was that depressed. And then I, it took me to go into a grocery store where I read this uh, article. And it said that, you know, at the time, my name was Chris Jackson. I, I hadn't become a Muslim yet. And it said he had, uh, he's a bust. <laughs> and that, that just lit a fire in me. And I said, well, I don't want to go out like that. And then so I started training a lot. And long story short, I became a Muslim after my first year. And then uh, the second year, I was going through the transition of losing weight and Ramadan and and then uh, the third, that third year, I got most improved. Mm -hmm. You know, just a couple of days ago, about, yeah, yeah, two or three days ago, mm -hmm. I just <laughs> happened to come across a clip uh -huh. <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> it was the first time I had ever seen it, you know, and it was just, uh, it, it was, it was exciting. <laughs> for Marshall, me to watch. Uh, I watch it. I watch it a couple of times, and and that uh, brings me to this next question: What do you recall about the February 1996 game when the Denver Nuggets broke the 18-game winning streak of the Chicago Bulls? You uh, were on fire during that uh, <laughs> during that game, my brother. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm gonna tell you exactly my mindset. I mean, you always, no matter who you play, you look to. When it's all said and done, win or loss, you want you want the world to remember you, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. And so it was no different that night, but there was something a little bit different in the sense that they had started playing Michael Jordan at the two, I mean, at the one, guarding one guards. And he had just left a couple of cities where I think Damon Stoudemire, the guard that used to play in uh, Toronto, had lit him up for some, for some good numbers. And somebody else had lit him up too, because it's a different position. It's yeah. like... Me playing Michael Jordan on the post all night, and he's six, six, six. That's a lot of weight, mm -hmm. you know, to carry around or to fight. And so I felt 
naturally so you're like hold on man <laughs> uh he's coming into our world in a sense mm -hmm. and i don't want to be the oddball Mm -hmm. you know, these guys just lit him up. Now he's coming to Denver. <laughs> you know, so it was like it was it was heightened for me at that moment. And yeah. so my my objective was, you know, from the door, I'm going to try to make it known that it's not that type of night. Uh, and then so it just so happens that he he was on me, but they eventually switched him off of me and and started sending a whole different array of, of people my way. But that that that's that's exactly what was on my mind during that time. <laughs> yeah, that was that was something, brother. Watching that clip, and I'm gonna I'm gonna when I when I uh, send this the link out uh, to this uh, uh, this conversation that you and I are having uh, mm -hmm. to those who didn't get the uh, the pre sent uh, YouTube link, I'm right. going to include that link as well, so folks who might want to see uh, some some exciting <laughs> moments during that game. Can can revisit it. Um, you you briefly touched upon uh, you know the time frame of your embrace of Islam. What was the circumstance that led you to Islam? And 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 again, when did that happen? Exactly when and and what the circumstance was? I had a lot of questions growing up. You know, I grew up in a Christian family. A Baptist persuasion. Um, in the South. Yes, in, in the, the South. South. In Mississippi, yeah. yeah. My, you know, more so coming from my grandmother, my aunt and uncle. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about even the sanctified churches. I don't, a lot of people don't know about those churches. You go in in the morning, you come out at night, you know, and, and literally. Yes. And so, uh, but I began to have questions. Um, and the problem was that when I began to ask certain questions, I would get two different responses and they were just unsatisfactory to me, but I didn't say anything, but you know, it sat with me for a while. And those responses were, you just got to believe and you can't question God. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to myself, well, God gives me a mind and I'm not questioning because I'm trying to be nasty about it. I'm questioning because I want to know, mm -hmm. I want to learn. And so long story short, I go to, I eventually get to, uh, LSU and the head coach Dale Brown, this pale white guy from North Dakota, he'll say that about himself as well. He hands me, he, he, he reads profusely. He hands me the autobiography of Malcolm. Oh my goodness. Yep. <laughs> and I, I never, and even at that time, which shows the lack of knowledge or insightfulness or exposure I had, I didn't know Malcolm. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know who Malcolm was. I was so immersed in basketball and trying to make it to the NBA and just doing my schoolwork. Mm -hmm. And and Dale knew a lot of people. He, I mean, he literally could get on the phone with Farrakhan. He can get on the phone with Dick Gregory. I mean, he's, I mean, he's well known. And I began to read his book. I mean, read the book on you know El Hajj Malik Shabazz, and I couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and I'm I'm thinking about him and his his upbringing. And how he seemed to tra definitely transformed himself. Yes. And I'm saying, wow, you know, and, and how his mind worked. Uh, very analytical, right? Um, Thought provoking. At the same time, I'm, I'm noticing how courageous he is mm -hmm. to speak his conscience in the front of anybody, in particular white people. Yeah. And I couldn't help but think about my life because I believe that your life your, your environment has a way of molding and shaping you. The things that you hear year in and year out, the things and the images that you see, you know, how you see your parents, you see your people that you admire, how when they have to confront white people, they have this like downtrodden look, this submissive look, like they can't speak their conscience, but in private, they're cursing, they're saying what they want, but in public. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that, I, feel, I saw myself carrying those qualities and I didn't like it. I knew it didn't, it didn't feel natural and I didn't want it for myself. And so I'm reading his book and I'm looking at, I'm, 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 I'm processing all of this and I'm saying, man, I want some of what he has. I'm, I'm competitive. So if I'm looking at the game and I'm saying things, well, you know, we see qualities in people that we know that we don't necessarily possess. Mm -hmm. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to say, you know, I don't have that, but I want it. Yeah. I like that. And so I just, I just uh, kept thinking about it. 
and uh, it got to the point where I was drafted to the NBA. And I'm, I'm missing a lot because I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I, I was drafted to the NBA. I met this guy named Mark James out of uh, New York, but I was still conflicted because you grew up, you grew up uh, all most of your life, and this is all you know, and you're afraid to let it go because you're thinking, well, what if I'm wrong? And so I'm still talking, even though I grew up as a Baptist, I'm talking to this, this Catholic priest in Denver. And he had a protege named Mark James. Make a long story short, Mark James and I became close one day in my home in private. Islam came up in conversation. And I said, man, you interested? He said, yeah, you? I said, man, yes. I've been reading Malcolm and I've never, you know, pursued going to, you know, pick up the Quran. But that's when he said that he met a Muslim brother named Abdullah at the airport because he worked at the airport. And he said he told us we can go and pick up the Quran. And we rushed. I'm talking about, man, I was like a kid, man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like literally, like I'm getting ready to, you know, back in those days celebrating Christmas. Can't wait yeah. to go and see what. And we go, we, we, there was a guy who was very hospitable to us, talked to us briefly. I couldn't hardly hear what he had to say because I was just thinking, man, I want to get my hands on this book. I need to go see what's in it. We rushed back to the house. He opened his, I opened mine, about two to three pages. I looked across the table at him. I said, I don't know about you. My search is over. I'm going to be a Muslim. Because what I read, <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, what I read in those two, three pages, I can't remember what it was, but I remember to this day how it made me feel and still makes me feel. Every time I pick up the Quran, it answered all the questions I had. I just, it was no doubt in my mind that this was the absolute truth. Yeah. at that moment and it's and i was asked not too long ago they said man what is it about islam that 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 attracts you i said from day one until now every time i engage it it has never ceased to satisfy my curiosity and answer my questions mm -hmm. and that's what drew me there and that's what keeps me there despite my despite my flaws <laughs> alhamdulillah you know it's interesting brother you know I, I can't help but be deeply touched by the fact that, you know, Malcolm's legacy continues to do dawah, and it is a, a legacy that has touched so many people, both here and abroad. Um, it was the beginning of my journey to Islam, yes. you know, as a, as a very troubled teenager. It was the beginning of my journey. And I'll never forget years later, when I was um, on, way, on my way to Hajj, uh -huh. I was on you know one of those international flights and my seatmate uh, ended up being a, um, for, for, for one of those connections, ended up being a Caucasian, uh, blonde haired, blue eyed, European, um, from one of the Scandinavian countries, so either Norway or Sweden. And, you know, at one point he decided, I'm, I'm, I'm reading and he decided, I guess he wanted to start up a little conversation or he could have been just been curious. Right. He wanted to know, um, he asked me, what was I reading? And I just turned the cover over and it was one of the books on Malcolm mm. and he smiled and he said, um, no, he was from Iceland because I remember his response. He said, he smiled and he said, you know, the most, the best selling books in Iceland are on Malcolm X. It just, mm. yeah, that blew me away, brother. Wow. But it's yeah. really something, you know, and, and it's a reflection of that ayah in the Quran that reads in translation do not say of those who are slain in the way of Allah that they are dead. Right. They are alive, receiving sustenance from uh, their Lord but but right. you perceive it not and this is one of the, the manifestations of that ayah you know True. malcolm was martyred but he is still <laughs> he is more alive today in the hearts of so many people around the world You're right than he was during the time when he was living and breathing on this side of the earth it's really right. something I, I agree and and his writings if you pick them up today uh the timeless mm -hmm. it's like it's 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 speaking to our situation right now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a tribute to his mind, mashallah. Now, Afi, 
let's for those who are not as much aware as they should be as as much aware as they want to be let us revisit the controversy that brought you <laughs> real national and uh, I would dare to say probably international attention. And uh, but also I want to connect with this revisit of that controversy. Um, I want I want to kind of uh, uh, try to invite you to, to to go into your head, into your psyche, and. And, and you know hindsight they say is 2020 right looking back on the controversy that erupted around the principal stand you took at the height of your career you were in your prime yeah. um the flag uh, you know that that controversy re regarding the flag do you have any regrets about what you did and if you could do it all over would you do anything differently? Um, to answer the first question, no, I do not have any regrets. Um, my, my policy has always been, I mean, for the most part is uh, whatever decisions that I make, if I can learn something for them, you know, they can build up on my character and who I am. There's no regrets whatsoever. I only regret constant mistakes that I'm making, if that makes any sense. But uh like you say hindsight is is is, is something else right um i would you know I, I don't know if you ask me would i do it again or would i change something yeah would you do anything differently yeah would i do anything differently um yeah. let me ask <laughs> looking back hind, looking back in hindsight yes we can we can say that but also the the other part of me and you already know this and i'm speaking yeah. you know, to a person who knows is that i was supposed to go through that yes that's right, right? Yeah. so but but if okay if i'm doing these intellectual teasers right yeah using hindsight i would say yes i would have liked to have been even now at 50 I would like to be more informed about the world, even now that I, I, I read profusely, but I still want to be more informed. Mm -hmm. I want to be stronger in my faith. I want to have stronger networks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I look at what Kaepernick did, right? I thought when I, when I did it, man, I was so happy that people in positions of wealth and fame, because it's good to see, right? Mm -hmm. It's good to see that side of, of people standing up and risking you know, their positions. But I was like, wow, look at the team that he has, right? They have Know Your Rights campaign. They're mm -hmm. doing things with sending uh, planes of food to Somalia. Well organized, it seemed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I was like, man, I wish I would have, uh, you know, thought that through yeah. in that way so that whatever you're doing, you always, you want it to come from your heart and be feasibly loud. Mm -hmm. At the same time, coming from your heart being feasibly loud, you want it to be the most impactful. And I think oftentimes when, if you're fortunate to prepare, it could be that way. But then again, on the flip side of that, maybe in preparing and thinking about the A, B, C's and D's, you end up not being as impactful and sometimes end up not doing anything because you're overthinking. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say I would have, I would have probably changed that, mm -hmm. that part of it. And that's saying a lot, you know, being more informed, um, having more of a network, having things in place um, uh, to galvanize as many people as possible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, definitely those things I, I, I would have if I if I if I would have placed myself back being how my mind is now. Yes. But on, on the flip side, too. You know, you got to be careful because sometimes those those things we we think too much and we think ourselves out of doing something mm -hmm. <laughs> right so yeah. alhamdulillah i don't have any regrets whatsoever and i'm still doing it you know i'm still taking these positions because i mean despite the fact that you know none of us are perfect you know we strive to be the best we can but there's one thing that i don't ever want to compromise is being that person who stand up 
you know, as Allah says in Quran, he says, speak out against justice, injustice, even if it's against yourself. Yes. You know, and so for me, I know what it feels like to be black in this country. On mm -hmm. top of that, to be Muslim in this country. On top of that, to be black Muslim with a disability, as some would call it, Tourette syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, and how you're viewed and how you're discounted, right? And so I I know how it feels. I don't I know how it feels to be poor, not to have a lot to eat, not to have sometimes the proper clothing to wear. So I never, I'm always putting myself in a position to never forget, never forget. And, 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 and so I, I'll, I'll, inshallah, I'll always be that person uh, that, that despite what may happen, you know, death or poverty, that I have to go out swinging. Mm -hmm. And that's just my policy. And a lot of that was influenced, as you were talking earlier about El Hajj Malik Shabazz. Yeah. And then, of course, becoming Muslim, all the other exemplary figures that we hear in history, the, the, the yeah. prophets, the yeah. imams, the caliphs, you, you name it. Uh, people in this country, outside of this country, the Patrice Lumumbas, the Nkrumahs, I mean, yeah. the list goes on and on. The people that inspiration that we can pull from. Yeah. Now, when you took that stand, uh, did you have any of the past sports related precedents in mind? You know, the injustice that was done, for example, to the Native American Jim Thorpe, uh, the 1968 Olympics, uh, Muhammad Ali's principal stand against military induction. Uh, did you have any of that in mind? You know, I knew of some. I knew of, of excuse me, obviously Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. right? But that wasn't in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew the I knew the potential consequences of of taking certain positions, but that wasn't in my mind. I'd gotten to the point, Maury, where, and even now, I've gotten to the point in my life, you know, growing up seeing the things and seeing people not feeling that they can speak their conscience, say what's on their mind, and be free to do that. And Malcolm influenced me big time with that. I said, man, I want that. I want to be, I want to have that courageousness to where I don't fear, but Allah, you know, and so, uh, uh oh, let me see. Uh, I, I missed my point. You just, what was I, what was, what were we talking about? Well, it, it, it uh, I asked you about precedence of any of the sports figures of the past yeah. or, or, yeah. or any of those issues. Alhamdulillah. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, I didn't, that was, even though I knew that that was there, mm -hmm. my main thing, Maury, was the truth is more important to me, mm -hmm. right? It was just about, you know, I started meeting people, man. I mean, when I became a Muslim, my best educational years at that time, all the way up to that point, wasn't what I learned in college, wasn't what I learned through junior high and high school and elementary. It was when I became a Muslim, almost every road trip that I took, brothers would meet me. I don't know how they found out, but they would find out where we stayed. Salaamu Alaikum, huh? Mm -hmm. And I was, man, so giving of my time. I'm just a people's person. I would, if I, if I felt good, and most of them made me feel good about them, I invited them up to my room. We would order room service. We would spend the nights until we had to leave the next morning because we didn't have the plane at the time. Mm -hmm. And we would literally talk about religion, sociology, psychology, history, because you got all these people with different disciplines. Yeah. And they would introduce me to books. You know, the Noam Chomsky's, Gore Vidal's, Randall Robinson, Kawaza Kunjufu's, Amos Ann Wilson's. And I'm trying to take it all in because I feel like, man, I've been deprived yeah. all of these years. Yeah. There's so much I don't know, and Islam uh, infused in me this 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 love for reading because when I became a Muslim, you had to fast during Ramadan, and I didn't know that it was it was highly recommended. I thought it was obligatory that you got to read a part per day. Mm -hmm. So when Ramadan was over, I finished the whole Quran. I felt a sense of accomplishment. And then on top of that, not just finishing it, I, I'm having conversations, and people think it's making sense. So that built that built confidence because yeah. I wasn't that person in class. I, as I said, I, w I would look at myself as being inferior. I wouldn't ask questions, didn't want to answer questions. I shied away from that. 
Mm -hmm. And so when I started reading, man, it started pricking my conscience. I started having an attitude because I'm like, wow, this thing is global. You know, this is just not here. There's a connection systemically with what's happening. It's like a design. And so I started getting angry. And my anger turned into, man, I got to, I, I can't like a law says in Quran, don't be like a donkey with books on your back. You got all this information. What you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. So I said, man, I got to do something. I just can't sit on this. Because, you know, Erin Dottie Roy says something. I use this all the time. She says, once you see something, you can't unsee it. To be silent, to say nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just as political and active speaking out. Either way, you're accountable. Mm -hmm. So now that I got this, am I going to be silent about it? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to take it? Because either way, I'm accountable. I said, well, shoot. If I'm just as accountable as being silent, I might as well go for broke. Mm -hmm. Let it all hang out. Yeah. So this was my position, and it still remains my position to this day. Yeah, Aaron Dati Roy, that's a very impressive Indian sister, man. I got <laughs> nothing but a lot of love and respect for her. Yes. Um, you know, it, it, it's really interesting, brother. You know, I, I, I want to say to the, especially the young folk who see this interview, who hear what you just said, I want to say to them, this is an example of a sterling observation made by um, that great freedom <coughs> fighter, Frederick Douglass. Mm. He, said, he said, a man, and of course, this equally applies to a woman, mm. is, is worked on by what he works on. He may carve out his circumstances, but his circumstances will carve him out as well. <laughs> well and, 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 and what you just described, brother, in your own life, you know, is an example of that. I mean, you know, you were like me. My first, yeah. the first book that I ever read that didn't have a lot of pictures in it, because I was a, when I was young, you know, I was a comic book, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, fan. I mean, I, uh, I, I had brother i had boxes of superman and batman and and and, <laughs> and thor and 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 you know subhanallah i had those daredevil if i had those boxes of books man still they would be collected by i, I have right. a lot of money in my hands brother that's right I remember one time my mother <laughs> i got into trouble <laughs> i got into trouble and as a punishment my mother threw out all of my boxes of comic Oh, wow. but you know you couldn't get me to read a book that right. didn't have a lot of pictures in it right. the first one was the autobiography of malcolm x mm. and i read that book in detention and i got mm. arrested for something and the, the 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 detention center the in fact it was a county jail well, I really shouldn't have been because I was a juvenile, but they had yeah. put me in this county jail and it was, for me, it was an example of the good. When I look back, the good that can come out of adversity mm -hmm. because the roughly, I think it was about a month and a half, two months that I spent in that jail is what led me to that little library because I didn't have anything else, yeah. you know, to fill my time with. And I just happened to see on the bookshelf, I was drawn to this book. It was the cutter of Allah. Mm. I was drawn to this book titled The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And I took that Asha. book back to the cell with me. And that book changed my life. Asha. I mean, it was, it was, a, it just, I was like you, Aki. Yeah. I want to be like him. That's right. And I, and I especially related to, you know, his hard, his very difficult upbringing, you know, especially after the, you know, his father was killed and his mother mm -hmm. ended up being institutionalized and the right. family was broken up and all the changes he went through. Man, I related to that. Um, right. So um, anyway, getting back to this discussion, uh, this, 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 well, the, <laughs> the, the formatted part of this discussion, you know, in our in our latest release, the uh, imprisonment of Imam Jamil Abdullah Al Amin is of the government conspiracy. There's a chapter. There's a chapter on the 1968 Olympic protests for human rights. Um, it's actually an interview uh, of the brother who led that uh, the the organization of that protest, uh, Dr. Harry Edwards. Harry Edwards. Yes. Um, my my good friend, broadcast journalist uh, Heather Gray, right there in Atlanta at WRFG. 
uh, she gave us permission to include that eye-opening interview in the book. By chance, did you did do you have a copy of the book? Which which, which I, was, book? I mean the um, uh, the the imprisonment of Imam Jamil Abdul Alamin. Is it a government? No, I don't have I don't have that one. Okay, I keep, when we finish up, I, um, well, text me text me your mail I will. address. Inshallah, okay. Allah, tomorrow I'm going to put a copy in the mail to you. MashaAllah. I, I want you to read it and I want to get some feedback from you on it. Okay. Inshallah, I love Allah. But, but that's the second chapter of the book. And it's an eye opening chapter, brother. Oh, um, it's really an eye opening chapter because, you know, what they did back then, it was mm -hmm. so. It was so profound and it was so very impactful then. And, you know, I, it, 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 it for me it reverberates to the here and now to where we are right now yeah. um anyway imam jamil the point that i wanted to make was that imam jamil who was himself an outstanding athlete mm -hmm. i heard he he also used sports to draw attention to america's inequities mm -hmm. you know um it's, it's really interesting but anyway inshallah tell, i'm going to send a copy of the book to you please do your thoughts on what's happening today in professional sports, Aki, on especially as it pertains to the protest front, uh, to the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, mobilizations that are taking place uh, here and abroad, and and the way that sports and sports figures have factored into the equation. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, you just said it. Uh, sports has always been, uh, I think sort of a catalyst in many ways of bringing attention to issues. Uh, Jack Johnson's, Muhammad Ali's, uh, even, you know, when you look at Paul Robeson, you know, oh, yeah. playing sports, right? Oh, yeah. So there, I mean, there's, there's numerous people that you can pull from, uh, men and women. And uh, I'm, I'm loving what I'm seeing in, in, in the sense of this, that people are becoming more vocal. They're becoming more visible. The fear that I have, and that's a strong word, is that so often when, you know, athletes, you, I like to say human beings who happen to be athletes, mm -hmm. uh, take positions, um, our, th these positions are easily co-opted. And, um, you know, Richard Itten, a political scientist, because it's popular now, right? It's popular to, to wear, I can't, I can't breathe t-shirts mm -hmm. to have black lives matter splattered on the court. Uh, you know, even coaches and people are getting into it. Right. Right. Um, to say things at the press conference, but you know, uh, national television, I mean, you name it, it's, it's become very popular. But Richard Itten, a political scientist made the statement that he cautious viewing. And, and I think there's a difference too, between protest, it might be a slight difference between protest and resistance, but he says he cautions viewing resistance as inherently revolutionary because once it becomes routine, it's easily anticipated by the dominant authorities and then therefore easily molded into their hegemonic understanding of things. So again, when you begin to say, well, we allow our players to do this, we allow our players to, you know, we're more progressive, and it becomes popular, it loses some of its punch. Um, prime example of, you know, the NBA talks a lot about how progressive it is. And compared to football, okay, it's a different story. But I think they're very sophisticated in how they deal with things. When they were in China, uh, James Harden and Westbrook, was, was getting, they were asked a question. And they were getting ready to talk about, speak their conscience. And they were stopped by somebody in the NBA saying, look, keep it to basketball. But I, I did a little reading and research, and I'm like, you know, and I know that there's some huge business interests mm -hmm. in China with the NBA, but also what I found out was that where the Uyghur Muslims, right, mm -hmm. are being, being victimized and genocide is being, you know, uh, one can say perpetrated upon them, the NBA has a facility in Uyghur, in that area. Mm -hmm. They're doing business there. Mm -hmm. And but, you know, this isn't highlighted. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I like the fact that people are speaking out. I like the fact that people are visible. Um, but I think also, you know, when we when we look at this thing, man, 
the, the, the concept of inclusion and diversity, right? Yes. Comes up. And there's this, it seems like there's this major push for, for to be visible and to be noticed, but it's often at, at the expense, I think, of real structural changes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, I, I think a powerful move could have been made if they would have just not played when 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 Milwaukee said, look, we're not playing. Mm -hmm. This is what United States does when they're trying to bring a country to the negotiating table and they don't want to listen, economic sanctions. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but there's so much that could be said about it. Um, but that that's pretty much it, it's nice to see. Um, I, and, and I think, too, and I mentioned this earlier, not with you talking to someone else that. And, and, and I have to look back at my situation. We have to know our limitations. Mm -hmm. So as athletes, it doesn't mean that we're not intelligent. Everybody has an opportunity or should have an opportunity. It looks like we're having a little bit of uh, uh, a challenge now with uh, our brother's uh, transmission, inshallah to Allah. Uh, Hello. Okay, got you. I apologize. Yeah, That's all right. everyone, everyone, whether you're an athlete, whether you, whether you work on a garbage truck, Everybody is entitled to speak their conscience. Mm -hmm. But I think also we have to be careful, me included. You know, there are people who study these issues, been studying these issues for life, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And sometimes we allow them to project us, mm -hmm. you know, into these positions as if though we are bona fide scholars and leaders, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and we're being used in so many ways. Right. It's okay. Speak your conscience. Say what you're going to say. And I'm for that. Look, because I'm still doing it. Right. But we also have to know our limitations. Mm -hmm. Right. And then also, I think if we can get to that point where we can begin and you you already know, man, just because you're a scholar, just because you're an imam, just because you. It don't mean that. You're on the right side. Right. Right. But I think when we begin to 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 join forces with each other, like the athletes who have the visibility, seek out those, that, that uh, intelligentsia, so to speak, that, that world of scholarship, those people that know the issues and that are really, that are not co-opted, that are not sold, I mean, you know, bought and sold, right. like bring those forces together. I mean, I think that's a powerful mix. Indeed. A powerful mix. Indeed. I, I agree. And, and, on that note, which which athletes today are are you most impressed with, and why? That's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it's bits and pieces of stuff that I see. Um, you know, I, I can't say that like overall, there's one athlete that, in terms of the total package, that right. you know I can look at. Sure. But I mean, I'm I'm liking a lot. You know, I'm liking. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of these these brothers, whether it's LeBron James, Chris Paul, whether it's the positions that Kyrie was trying to take, right? Whether it's uh, what's the the lady that Maya Moore, right, fighting for, you know, uh, uh, the false incarceration of the brother that I think she ended up marrying, right? But still pushing those issues of mm -hmm. false incarceration and things of that nature. Man, those are beautiful things. Mm -hmm. Beautiful things, uh, and 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 establishing the nonprofit organizations to help people, right? To support mm -hmm. causes, and they're they're not just establishing. Some of these are not just establishing them in terms of it's a it's a it's an organization on paper, but no, they're involved. Mm -hmm. They're out there in the streets, you know. Um, Malcolm Brogdon, the athletes that went out and and protested, right? Uh, uh, um, What's his name? Uh, Stephen Jackson that's constantly talking about these issues, right? So I'm, those are some of the things that, that keep, keep influencing me, keep inspiring me, keep giving me hope, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. uh, to continue on top of already what my religious orientation is with Islam, you know, mm -hmm. when I see stuff like that. Okay. The... 
let me, before I forget, I just want to mention, are you, are you still based in Atlanta? Are you still in Atlanta? Yes, I'm in Atlanta, but I've been in, I've been in New York though for about over three months training. So oh. that's why I'm in this car right now. I'm oh, constantly moving. Right. <laughs> You've been in New York yeah. training, you say? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I'm training some NBA, some NBA guys. Okay, mashallah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I was about. Uh, well, so you are you? Do you expect to still be in New York uh, next weekend, or will you be back home? And the reason why? Oh I, no, I mean, inshallah. The reason why I ask is because you know there's going to be a national rally for Imam Jamil uh, uh, next Sunday in Atlanta. There's a national rally for Imam Jamil, and uh, there, and also on the uh, um, on the West Coast where Amir. Abdul Malik Ali is in Oakland. There's going to be a, a national a rally there yeah. as well. So, but but the main national rally is going to be in Atlanta, Georgia. And right now, we're in a very unique uh, space and uh, opportunistic time to, um, you know, hopefully get uh, have a a way paid for a, you know, long overdue resolution right. of his case. So inshallah ta'ala, your brother Salakan is planning to be there in Atlanta for this uh, rally next weekend. And I was just wondering if you were going to be there and, and if I might uh, uh, see you there as well. Uh, but anyway. I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to get there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, alhamdulillah. 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 Well, Aki, we are winding down now. And um, there, it's, there was one other question I had in mind I wanted to raise. And right now, I, it, 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 it escapes me. So what I'm going to do is invite you to share some, uh, to, to, to share whatever closing thought that we might not have touched upon uh, that uh, you would like to, oh, oh, before we get to your closing thought, this is what I wanted to, I wanted to ask you. I've, I've noticed, Saki, that uh, during the course of this, discussion that you and I have been having I have not seen an indication of you know that that challenge that you've had that uh, that you know uh, Tourette's Tourette's syndrome brother syndrome yeah well, what's 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 you, going you, on you, you, must've, you, must've, you must you must you must you must you must have been doing some heavy blinking and missed it <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh look i've learned how to camouflage it to an extent to integrate it into my natural movements but they're there you know it, you, you brother you i i, I want to say to you brother and i and i mean this with all of my heart i really mean this you know with the the, the brother as much brotherly love as i can you know uh, send through these uh, these airwaves. Uh, you know, I have I have a tremendous amount of love and respect for you. I've had for years, for years, and um, you know um, this conversation that you and I have just had um, has just deepened the well of that love and respect that I've had for you for so such a long time. Uh, now, with that said, um, no, we still got seven minutes listen. left. Are, are there any? Any thoughts that you have that we didn't touch upon that you would like to share with the uh, with the audience? Anything that well, I'm, you I'm sure there's so many of them, um, but I can get long winded, and I'm afraid that if I start on some of them, I might not be able to finish. But oh, I'll oh. just say this: um, yeah, um, you know, I'm big on I'm big on reading. Yes, I'm big on. Uh, quotes and things of that nature and um, there's a and, and I'm always trying to to leave with at least a couple um, of, of, of quotes something hopefully that could influence people and make them think and um, analyze their life a little differently but you know George Washington Carver man and I, I keep this literally I think about this daily you know, I keep it in my kitchen. He's, he said something. He has a quote that I try to live by. Uh, he said, no one has the right to come into this world, then go out of it without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. 
Mm. You know, and I think about man, you know, a lot of blessed us with gifts and potential, and who are we to waste it? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think one of the most noble things that we can do if we tr really want to leave a legacy worth leaving is to be people, man, who think about, you know, you know, there's a verse, you know, we all know it in Allah that Allah won't change the condition of a people until you change what's in yourself. Or some, as Muhammad al would say, Allah won't change your social condition until you change your social cells. <laughs> and what was interesting about that verse when I was looking at it, you know, Allah mentions qawm, he mentions people before he mentions self. As if though saying that society is more important by and large than just the individual. Mm -hmm. And so when we move, navigate throughout this life that we're living in, you know, to really think in a way that's bigger than ourselves. Think about doing something that involves something bigger than ourselves. You know, there's a saying that if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. Mm -hmm. The goal in life is to find your gift. The purpose in life is to give it away because you can't take any of this with you. Right. And so if I was to leave anything, I would, I would, you know, and do all of that with, with a divine purpose. Right. Uh, and I think really, in, uh, I think really if we take that approach, uh, I think we can, we can start making a dent on progress, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think it's ever going to be a utopia where it's, but I think we can do it in major pockets to where mm -hmm. we can really bring about some serious change. So alhamdulillah, I would, I would just say that. Uh, uh, brother uh, Sadiq, inshallah ta'ala, we will bring this to a close and I will communicate with my brother offline, inshallah ta'ala. I uh, want to be uh, end this uh, broadcast by, uh, you know, again, really, really expressing my deepest uh, appreciation to our brother Mahmoud Abdul Raouf uh, for uh, joining us for this conversation. I know that not only I, but everyone who um, was able to tune into this live, you got a lot out of it. And um, others who will see it later uh, will get a lot out of it as well. Uh, with that said, I'm going to end as I um, accust uh, uh, customarily end uh, this uh, weekly broadcast with uh, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from uh, the Surah Al Asr in the Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr. Innal insana lafi kusr. Illa ladina amanu wa amalu salihat wa tawassaw bil haq wa tawassaw bil sabr in the name of allah the beneficent the merciful by the token of time through the ages verily humanity is in loss except those who believe and do good and exhort one another to truth and exhort one another to patiently persevere thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon and this evening in South Africa, peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum.